It's too hot. Hi, everyone. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar, which we're going to be talking about the history of space exploration. The history of space. Yes. Ah, this is a great day. Great day. You know, when you're not plugged in oxygen, it's hard to <laughs> hard to breathe in those things. Well, here we are on the launch pad. Behind us, you can see a faithful, uh, you know, recreation of a rocket on the launch pad getting ready to launch. This is one of my favorites. This is going to be an exciting year in space. This, this is going to be one of the best times ever in space exploration. I'm James. I'm um, Diego. And we're going to be talking to you about space stuff. Uh, Diego, I think that you have some things to, to walk us through today. Oh, yeah. OK. Oh, yeah. Good. Well, let's just pop into the Q&A section really quick and say hello to people. Hello to Madeline. Lorda says, happy Earth Day. Happy yeah. Earth Day, everyone. Happy Earth Day. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, today is Earth Day. If you were on the broadcast with me and Marty yesterday, we were talking about Earth Day and why it's important to take care of the Earth. It's the only one we got. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'd love to hear where some people are from. We can get some quick feedback. Where are you from? And okay. Where are you tuning in from? And hello to Denali and Mackenzie and to Chris and Alette. And a whole bunch of people are saying, wow, hey, here we go. Uh, Kanan and Cleo and happy Earth Day to you too, Hartley. Ethan. Ethan's here and there's Jackson. Yes, Jackson, that is the Falcon Heavy. That is yeah. absolutely correct. Cool, one of the coolest rockets. <laughs> All right. Okay, wow, okay. Hello to the uh, 100,000 people that just uh, put, put their comments into the Q&A section. I'm sorry if I can't get to everyone. Also uh, from Mexico too. Oh, good, yeah, so Indiana. Ethan is from Florida. Great, Ethan, are you anywhere near the launch sites down there? Ethan probably saw the Falcon Heavy. Oh, I'm jealous, I'm jealous. jealous. We should do a field trip. Yes. We should go see a rocket launch. Yeah. All right. Alette is from Southern California, and Soy says, happy Earth Day from Indiana. Amelia is from Mexico. Moises, hi Moises. Okay, wow, so many people. Good, 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 good. For some reason, the lighting is making you both look yellow. Yes, uh, I've been playing around with the lighting. I'm, I hope to get us a little bit more natural colored in here, but you know, for now, uh, we'll, we'll just take what we have. Kanan's from Indiana. Okay, great, people from all over the place. Diego. Let's begin. Let's begin. Okay, we got a great presentation for you. Um, this is the history of space exploration. Uh, this photo is James and I, my boys, and astronaut Catherine. Oh, I'm drawing a blank on her name. She's, uh, if someone knows the name of her, go feel free to. Well, I knew it, and then you forgot it, so then I forgot it. Johnson? <laughs> Catherine Johnson. That sounds right. Yeah, yeah. She's an incredible woman. It was such an honor to meet her. I'm just walking into this space symposium. To, to try to find Diego and meet up with him. He's like, James, come over here, take a picture. I'm like, okay. And he told me afterwards who this was. <laughs> who is this? Yeah, this is Katherine Johnson. Um, she, she was part of the shuttle program. Um, I am pulling up some stuff on her right away just to make sure. We, it's always exciting um, at the space symposium. We'll fill that in in a, in a bit. <laughs> <laughs> we got more people coming in. Good, yeah, yeah, more people. Christian says uh, he's from Colorado. Uh, that's where that photo was taken. Boulder. That's right. Yep, that's right. Space Symposium. Has anybody out there been to the Space Symposium? Ooh. <laughs> All right. Okay. Good. All right. All right. Well, let's move Excellent. on. Excellent. Yeah. We're um, gonna move on. Okay. So. There's a long and proud history of humans exploring space, isn't there? Or even before we actually explored space, we were thinking about it. Yeah, when, I mean, when we talk about space exploration, when does that really start? Um, I would say it started, I mean, 50 years ago, roughly, is when we landed on the moon, uh -huh. almost 51 years ago. But even before that, I mean, some of the first real rockets were being made in the 1940s. One of the, some of the first really big, intense, able to actually get somewhere quickly rockets. Uh, and before that, I mean, you you have uh, uh, like a clip, uh, uh, 
Cover. Yeah. That's the word. Yeah. I completely blanked on the word cover for a second. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a cover from an old science fiction. Yeah, they used pack. to the, they used to make these things. There, you might have heard of Pulp Fiction, um, but they used to make a bunch of uh, readers, and they were uh, made out of pulp, which is uh, just like just, like super cheap paper, really cheap and easy to print on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so people would buy their pulps and read about you know some of these amazing adventure stories about what was go what was happening and you know space drama and it was just you know fun things for people to read and look at the cover of this this is a cool cover this so is a cool cover we have a rocket it's landed on a planet that's got active volcanoes going you can see two volcanoes there you can see cracks on the ground it looks like a very dry barren planet and it looks like maybe the rocket is damaged a little bit you can see fire coming out of it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. Someone had hit it. Yeah. Well, and then all the way to present time on our right, we have the Starship. This is being assembled in Boca Chica, Texas right now. Um, Elon Musk is going full bore. He's just, he, him and his team are nonstop working on this thing. Um, 2020 is going to be an amazing year mm -hmm. for space exploration, space development. So I was really excited about that. Um, do you know the date of the the next launch? Uh, big gonna... important thing coming up at the end of May. I forget the exact date. Maybe the twenty fourth. I think it's May. Yeah, that sounds about right. I think May twenty fourth. Um, it hasn't been since twenty eleven that people launched into space from America. Every person that's gone to space since twenty eleven has launched from a launch site in Russia, Kazakhstan. And um, that's great, we, we still have access to space, but uh, we're gonna talk a little bit later about the space shuttle. They retired the space shuttle, they shut down that program in 2011, and since then we've been waiting for the, the next American spaceship to be uh, finalized so that we could send humans to space from America. That's coming. Um, Amelia says that my haircut was weird in that picture. Amelia, you're absolutely correct. Yeah, I, that's, that was my first thought, too. Um, all right. <laughs> Caroline asks, how big is his team? I, I believe you're asking about Elon Musk. I think it's in the thousands. Yeah, it's got to yeah. be in the thousands. It's a huge, huge uh, project that they're doing. It's hard to send people to space. Yeah, it's they, really hard. It's really dangerous. We're going to talk about that. They have engineers in McGregor, Texas, Boca Chica, uh, Kennedy Space Center, and then Southern California in Hawthorne. Yep. which our school, our, our school just went on a business trip. We had about 30 students from Delphian that went and got a, a tour of um, SpaceX. It was very cool. I am, I really <laughs> wish I had been there. <laughs> uh, Chris asks, is that picture on Mars for the science fiction? No, Chris, that's not Mars. That's a fictional planet. That, that's a made up planet that the artist uh, just kind of made up for the purposes of that story of, that picture. Mars does not have active volcanoes. Yeah. Um, all right. Great. Good. Oh, and someone asked, who is Elon Musk? Thank you, Viola. Oh, it, great. <laughs> Elon Musk is a businessman, billionaire guy. Um, if you've ever used PayPal to buy anything online, he was one of the guys that started PayPal. He used his fortune from that to start a space launch company and the Tesla car company and a few other things. Mm -hmm. And his, he's, he's one of the guys really leading the way right now on pushing space exploration technology, pushing rocket technology to, to new limits so That's that right. we can do more. A really neat guy. I've met, I met, I had the chance to meet him one and I'll probably talk about that moment till the day I die. Just a cool guy. He's just <laughs> yeah. a really super cool guy. All right. Well, the next slide. Yeah. yeah. So here's, here's another cover from a science fiction uh, novel, a science fiction magazine. And on the right is a drawing of what, let's see, let me go back one. So there is the current build of the Starship. That's a test. That's a test vehicle there that is not actually meant to go to space. They're just kind of building early models right now, full size to figure stuff out. Here's it. Uh, on the right of this screen here is uh, what it might look like once it's finally launched in, in space. And you can see that the designs of 
now and of the future are taking a lot of inspiration from <laughs> the science fiction illustrations of the past. There are so many similarities when you look at some of the some of the early guys. Mm -hmm. You know, and the, the oh, interesting thing. 1939, February oh, 1939. Yeah, sheesh, yeah, this is the golden age of science fiction. And some of the, a lot of people don't realize this, but some of the top science fiction writers, they actually have a significant science background. Mm -hmm. um, some, uh, some people have tried to write science fiction and they don't, they don't know the science behind stuff. And then so people who do know science, they don't read their stuff. But you'll be surprised, people at NASA, they love science fiction, especially good science fiction that has mm -hmm. like possible things. Like, so when you hear people talking about Star Trek, Star Wars, um, there's certain things that have more probability of actually coming to existence. Yep. Yeah. And one of the purposes of science fiction, of any kind of fiction, any, any imaginary writing that you do, but for me, especially science fiction, is to envision things that could happen that could be you're solving problems that don't exist yet which is great i love that i love that and you're coming up with ideas maybe those ideas will actually come into creation one day i mean one guy at one point had the idea that when you walk towards the door it just opens by itself <laughs> yeah and you see that in star trek and for a while that was just science fiction and now every supermarket that you walk into it does that right you like I still do that i still just like this is amazing we have star trek technology in walmart and guys we're living in the future you know this this concept again from star trek that you could have a device in your hand that could scan someone and that could say like okay good th this person has a fever they might have this disease or they have a broken bone or something like this this medical diagnosis machine that it's, that's handheld they have stuff like that nowadays and they're, they're they're working on making it even better yeah if you've ever seen a tesla you walk up to a tesla and the door handle presents itself i yeah. think that's just the coolest thing <laughs> yeah okay so okay on to the next go. one um so i'm loving this quote this is a quote from our uh headmaster trevor rot in times like these it is possible to get the idea that the ground we are standing on isn't stable enough to build upon. But that notion is false. The future is built first and foremost with ideas and ideas are not dependent on the physical world. An individual doesn't need stable ground to throw a big idea far, far into the future. In fact, many of history's inventions, inspirations and renaissances were created by individuals during the most unstable and unpredictable of times. Trevor Ott, our headmaster. I think Trevor, Hits it right on the nose there. What does this mean to you? Well, to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What does it mean to her? Let's right. break this down. I mean, yeah. it's a big quote. I know we have some younger uh, people in our audience, but um, I, and I thought about, you know, reproducing this quote, but, but I want to talk about what this means. Okay, good. Well, I'm, I'm going to give you all uh, a minute to put your answers into the q and I'm going to catch okay. up on a few questions here. Lorna was asking, where is the launch going to take place? Lorna, um, I, I think you were asking about the launch of humans launching from America back to space at the end of May. That's gonna be happening in Florida out of Cape Canaveral down there. Um, and Lily asks, what is that behind you? That is a video of yeah. the Falcon Heavy rocket. And it is the most powerful ro um, rocket that is in use today. There have been more powerful rockets used in the past, some of which we're gonna talk about in our uh, webinar today, but that thing can send a ton of stuff to space and it's really cool. Um, I stole this video from about two years ago from the initial test flight that they did. Uh, Caroline asked, did they make spaceships that look like that? Uh, a, a lot of these drawings, I'm gonna go back a few clips here. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that drawing that you see on the left, that is a, that's a made up design. Um, that's the artist just thinking, what would look cool as a spaceship? But as you can see, those thoughts and those that, that <laughs> testing through art is still influencing. I mean, this was drawn 75, 80 years ago or more, but it's still influencing our design today, as you can see on the right side of the screen. Again, with this, this is from February 1939. At that time, in 1939, they had not made a starship that looked like that. They had not made a spaceship, but we're working on making one now. Um, and then this design here, this is a design 
concept for a space station. It looks like it's seen some battle. It's kind of breaking apart there. But that that ring idea where the ring mm -hmm. turns around a center is a very easy way to make artificial gravity. And that's in one of space. the big barriers that that science fiction um, writers even saw is that there, that how do you make gravity? One of a uh, really cool idea that I saw that I read about in a science fiction book was this idea of gravity coils. And I actually had a chance to uh, ask an astronaut about this and I got a total pause out of him. He was like, that is interesting. But my question was, um, would it be possible with enough energy to make gravity with lasers? Gravity with lasers. Yeah, yeah. And hmm. the interesting thing is if you accelerate something fast enough, you can get, um, uh, you can get a, a resemblance of mass. So this idea in sci-fi that a sci-fi author wrote, um, there's some plausibility to it. There's, of course, tons of things to be worked out. But the idea is that there's an idea and then uh, the science fiction writer or sorry, the scientist goes to the lab and then works it out. They do some tests, they mm. figure things out. They, they come up with a prototype. It might look really funny, but um, it, uh, it ends up bringing out some other discovery, so. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. Uh, Evelyn asks, have you ever gone to space? No, we have not. <laughs> uh, I, would, I would love to. There is hope. There I would is love still, to. There is still hope. I, I can't wait to talk about this tomorrow too, or the mm -hmm. future of space flight. Um, there's a pretty good chance that uh, you guys will be going to space on a regular, even if you're not an astronaut. Like there's some cool technology. Uh, we'll get into that yeah. tomorrow. Tune in tomorrow. <laughs> yep, tomorrow. We're going to be more on space exploration. Yeah. Lorna asks, is the rocket going to launch at the end of the webinar? No, this is actually, <laughs> if, you, if you're watching, you'll see it's actually just a 10 second loop. It's the same thing over and over again. I just think well, it's cool. A lot of the, our guys at home are probably meeting their teachers and stuff on Zoom. Mm -hmm. um, you want to tell them how they could do this? Um, maybe we'll cover that. Okay, in a, yeah, there's so much to talk yeah, about. Yeah, true, true. All right. Um, <laughs> Uh, Viola says the quote means we're getting back to Trevor's quote here. Thank you, everyone. The quote uh -huh. means that there has been many space space experiments in the past, but the space team is still trying to find ways to settle for more in the future. Yeah, cool. I, I like that. That's great. Cool. Evan asked, did you guys see the satellite thing a couple days ago? There were like 40 satellites in the sky, all moving in the same direction. Ooh, mostly you gotta following. I, ha I haven't seen that in person yet. Right. That is uh, part of the Starlink satellite constellation and there's a few hundred of them in space right now and um, there's going to be several more hundred launched over the next few years and there, there are a bunch of satellites that when when it's when the planet is done there's going to be satellites covering you know in, in kind of regular orbits around the planet so that anywhere on earth that you are you'll be able to get an internet connection anywhere on earth here in Oregon, in the middle of Colorado, on the top of a mountain, at the bottom of a valley, in the middle of the ocean, you'll be able to get an internet signal, uh, which is really, really cool. All right, uh, someone says, I think this means that even if it seems like no idea can be heard or thought of in these times, uh, no matter how big or small this idea may be, one can be heard. All that is needed for you to do is to put this idea out there and start making it real for yourself. I love that answer. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, Evelyn asks, how hard is it to make a spaceship? Mm -hmm. Really hard. Um, we're going to talk about what it took to actually get people up to space. Yeah. Um, okay. Oh, Akanksha asks, what does Renaissance mean? Renaissance is when there's a bunch of ideas and developments and new things all happening in a very short period of time. Yeah, yeah. Right now, you know, there's some things that are a little chaotic but there's some people thinking of some great ideas there's people that are planning for the future putting ideas into mm -hmm. the future um, people are rethinking school rethinking education business opportunities nba nfl um geez i mean it, it's just like it, there's so many ideas being uh put out there that yep. it's things the future starts with ideas it <laughs> does so let's talk a little bit i mean we, we've been talking kind of like the first step of space exploration was just people sitting down and be like, gosh, wouldn't it be great if we could go to space? Uh, yeah. Wouldn't it, that be cool? That was the first step, just making it up. Yeah. And then a bunch of guys were like, well, let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is Von Braun in the 1930s and 40s. Um, 
Nazi Germany uh, saw the possibility of using long distance rockets as weapons. So initially, the, yeah, the, the rockets were being used in a bad way. Um, and there was a scientist who had uh, some amazing ideas on rocketry. Um, the United States ended up uh, getting von Braun. And I don't know the details on it. I, I just know that he, he was... Uh, he was a Nazi scientist at one time and then ended up developing the United States space program. And it, to me, it is interesting because once the space race um, changed everything, because we started like looking upwards and, and started kind of uniting. Right now we have the International Space Station, which is just this amazing um, thing, partnership between lots of countries that brings mm -hmm. people on board a spaceship to, to challenge the environment to see if we can live in space which in my opinion is much better than war efforts. <laughs> yeah, Caroline it asks, is that why there was the space race for weapons? Actually, th the space race wasn't even for weapons. The, the real race for the space race was who could do stuff in space first? Who could get the first satellite up there? Who could get the first man into space? Um, who could get the first man orbiting the planet who could get people up into space the longest who and the real prize the real real prize was who was the first uh country that could get a man on the moon yeah um, and bring them back right right yeah and the, this it was like a it was like an engineering challenge mm -hmm. um and it you know seeing what you know like i compare war how much we spend on war compared to how much nasa uh, how much is spent with NASA. And I'm a big NASA fan because a lot of those things, those, those space, they're called space spinoffs. They end up in our homes. They end up um, like Velcro. If it wasn't for the space program. I love Velcro. <laughs> Velcro. That was developed through the space program. Yeah. Memory foam. Yep. Memory foam was developed through the space. Thank program. you, NASA. For my <laughs> pillow. Uh, CDs, DVDs, Blu-rays, all that developed through NASA just kind of messing around with technology. Like we have a problem to solve. We need this kind of thing. It doesn't exist. Let's make it. And then it shows up in modern, you know, you can yeah, like, um, go and buy I, it for, you know, like oh, a nickel. Right, right. In our lab, if we have a student who needs to warm something up, he grabs his little beaker, puts it in the, in the microwave, and all of a sudden we have instant hot water. That's yep. microwave. Space, that's a space spin off. Yeah. As, uh, father of two kids, I was very grateful for modern diapers. You know, you, <laughs> mod, listen, modern, like diapers, as you know, just these disposable diapers, you buy them by the dozen, you use them once, you throw them out instead of having to clean them out. That didn't come around until the 80s. And that was a direct result of NASA and the space program. Like we need to solve this problem in space. Astronauts go into the bathroom in space. Thank you for my child's diapers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we could moving along. All day about space Lorna race. says about the space race, we won, but the Russians also won. Correct and correct. Humanity won. People won. Yeah. All right. right. So Ooh, this, what's this? This is Sputnik. Sput Bless you. Yeah, Sputnik. <laughs> um, this um, really starter started the modern uh, space race. Uh, this was a um, satellite developed by uh, the by Russia or by the USSR at the time. And um, they were able to get this object to orbit the earth um, and the United States verified it. And that was like a, it was, it, it wasn't anything harmful. Like this wasn't like a, it wasn't even really much of a spy satellite, but it flew over the United States and all this fear came about, right? People were like, well, what if, what if uh, Russia would have dropped a bomb on us? And you know, it was, it was, it was definitely a scary threat, yeah. um, but it propelled our engineers to um, put some more energy into developing capabilities as well. Um, so this gives you an idea of, uh, you can make one of these at home. You can get a ball, put a couple uh, pins in it, and you'd have a model of Sputnik hang yeah. it from your ceiling in your room. And Modern GPS, modern global positioning system technology, the thing that allows you to pull up your phone and have it tell you like, where's the nearest Taco Bell is a direct result of that satellite flying over the United States. Yeah. And, and there was an engineer who saw it flying over and, and you could tune in on the radio and you could hear it going ping, 
ping. Yeah. It was like beeping as it flew by as a way of like, that's really all this thing did. It just ordered the earth and it beeped and people could hear it beep through the radio. Just Russia saying, ha ha, we did it first. Yeah. And there was, a, there was a guy who started doing the math in his head. He said, you know, from, from that pinging, from that beeping, I could figure out where it is. If I know exactly where I am on the ground, I could use math and science to figure out where it is precisely up in space. And that idea evolved over the years, but very quickly he started working on a technology to, um, if you could get a signal from something, just even a binging, a, a pinging, a beeping, you could figure out exactly where it was. So thank you for helping me find, you know, the nearest Taco Bell. Yeah. yeah. R, <laughs> that's, that's right. <laughs> a lot of modern benefits. Um, uh, our science fair in Colorado was started because of Sputnik. Once they started, the United States went, whoa, we need engineers, we need mathematicians, we need all these people. We really, uh, the launch of STEM um, as a nation. STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. Yeah. Consider it as one subject together. Yep. Yeah, that's right. And yeah. so um, if you've ever participated in science fair, especially west of the Mississippi, that was directly the result of, um, of Sputnik. Yep. All right. W.J. Harrison says, didn't Russia get the first person in space, but we got the first oh, man we're, on the we're, moon? we're getting there. We're Correct. Getting there. Yes, we're, we're going to get there. That's Ethan amazing. says, fun fact, the first thing in space were two fruit flies. I did not know that, that the first, first living, living thing, the, yeah, yeah. the first living things, but that would make sense to send fruit flies because, you know, you're not going to miss them. Yeah, I, I read that. I forget where, what, uh, yeah. what, if you could chime in with what mission that was, that's great. And Henry um, says, should we say thanks to Russia? Thank you for my Taco Bell. Henry, we should <laughs> say thanks to Russia. We should say thanks to the humans, to the people working yes, for the Russian up, space program, for the American space program. This is coming for up. Every in, space program. This is coming up in four slides. Let's All right, go. good. All right, moving on, moving on. Oh, there, there's a diagram of Sputnik. Yeah, this is a diagram of Sputnik. You can find these online, print them out, decorate your room with them. Really cool. It's neat to just walk through and see what they had. Um, in, inside Sputnik, there was a camera, I believe, this number two guy right here. There was a cooling system, um, some electronics for radio. Okay. And then the four sticks that were coming out were the antennas. Good. Uh, and the thing all bol bolted together in two uh, hemispheres, two half half globes yep uh, lorna says i thought that the americans were afraid that it was going to take pictures you know like spy on us oh yeah they were very scared of that and for good reason i mean both sides wanted that russia wanted spy satellites and america wanted spy satellites and very quickly they they both got them uh but first it was just can we just send a thing up and just get it up there yeah okay then the first man in space, Yuri Gagarin. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, Gagarin. I've been corrected by that by some of my Russian students. You say it like, do you know what I'm saying? I, I, I just say Gagarin, Gagarin. Yuri Gagarin. Yeah. And I'm sure I'm saying it like an American, not with the proper pronunciation, Gagarin. but Yuri that's Gagarin. okay. I love how my Russian students say it. It's the coolest thing. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, Russian is one of the, uh, Russian at times is the official language on the space station. Anytime uh, a cosmonaut takes command of the space station, that cosmonaut is a Russian astronaut. Thank you. America Thank you. calls them astronauts. Russia calls them cosmonauts. And the Chinese call them taikonauts. That's right. Taikonauts. Yeah. All right. You can see the headline here. Man enters space. Um, let's see. A Soviet officer orbits globe in five ton ship. Maximum height reached reported at 188 miles. And <laughs> the next headline right there, so close yet so far, size Cape. Cape being, uh, was, was it called Cape Kennedy? Cape Canaveral. At that time? Cape Canaveral. It, it was called Cape Canaveral. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where the United States was basing all of its major space exploration and launches and stuff. US had hoped for own launch. And of course, an American newspaper had to be like, we almost had it. <laughs> they beat us to it, but we were really close. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I got a firsthand account of what it was like when Yuri Gagarin uh, went to space from uh, Artie. He is one of our students here. He's from Russia. And his mom, or his, sorry, his grandma told him what it was like. They said they got let out of school. People were in Russia celebrating. I mean, the way he described the story was so cool. So I love hearing these firsthand accounts yeah. um, from, you know, you know I, I was relayed that from 
one of my students grandmother <laughs> <It's> really cool <laughs> There we go. Yeah. And we still celebrate Yuri Gagarin today, even if I don't say his name correctly. Um, there's a yearly celebration called Yuri's Night. Yeah, yeah, which just happened. Um, we had a, a space helmet build. That's where we built these guys. So we had a space helmet here. Space helmet build here in, uh, at Delphian. And, you know, we had to be socially distanced and all that. And, uh, but we got out the cardboard, we built helmets, we saw the live broadcast. Chris um, Hatfield tuned in, had some great words about making the most of your time while you're here in quarantine. And, uh, you know, kind of uh, just gave, gave that space viewpoint, you know? And I love looking at space because it makes all our problems seem so small when you just go yeah. through the vast it's like bigness of space. <laughs> Why fight each other when you could work together to send a man to the moon, even if you're competing against each other, you know, if you and I are in a race, you know, it's like, hey, I'll race you to the dining room. Yeah. I'm going to run faster just because I'm competing with you. Right. Not that you're my enemy. We're working towards this goal together, but I kind of want to get there first. Right. We have this high level game are going on. But yeah, it's, it's a game. And, and when it's a game and people realize it's a game, it's just so much fun. So much more fun. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, I'm more competitive than you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, uh, oh, race. Lily asked, who's the first person to go to space? Lily, that, that's, that's uh, this guy. You can mouse over this guy here. That. This guy, his name is Yuri Gagarin. Uh, Henry asked, have you ever met anyone who really went to space? Yes. yes. There she is, Catherine. <laughs> Catherine Johnson. And Collins? Eileen Collins, yeah. Eileen Collins. Eileen Collins. We were using the wrong name. Yeah. Anyway, there she is. She's been to space. She has been a commander on the space shuttle a couple times. Oh, I, I, Eileen Collins is the lady oh. that gave you the Allen Ship career. Did, right. My bad. I'm just mixing up all this <laughs> stuff. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so go back to Yuri's night there. This uh, mouse over that. We, this is Yuri Garger, and that is the emblem. So if you see that logo, you're talking about Yuri's night. It's a global celebration. Good. Is Yuri Gagarin a girl or a boy? Uh, boy. There, there have been many women who have gone to space, but the first many people that both sides, both Russia and America, sent to space were men. Yeah. And coming up, um, at least last I heard, it was slated for 2024, will be the first uh, woman on the moon. Yeah. Yeah. That's an ambitious goal. We'll, we'll Make sure you're here tomorrow. <laughs> Time is flying. Uh, we have 11 minutes left. What? We are going to power okay. forward. Okay. Power forward. Enough Jeez. chatter. Let's go. Okay. Who are these people? This is Eisenhower, President Dwight D. Eisenhower. He um, commissioned NASA in 1958. So this was shortly after Gargarin um, went to space and they, they were like, okay, that's it. We need to double down on this thing. We need to to really push forward um, our space related endeavor. And so um, this is them in their hands there. They signed the, basically the, what established NASA. So that's the significance of Yay. this. Yay. Canon asks a good question. Who first called it the space race? I don't know, probably some really uh, clever reporter <laughs> who was like, hey, I've got it. <laughs> okay. okay. And then we got the, the next thing. This is Alan Shepard. Yay, Alan Shepard. Alan Shepard was the first American in space. Um, he was one of the first seven uh, astronauts um, so, uh, formed by NASA, and um, he's just done a ton of things. And uh, wasn't he the first American to orbit the planet? First American to orbit the planet. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And this is a picture of President Kennedy, and Kennedy had a famous speech where he said, we choose to go to the moon. In this, in this decade, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. Um, he actively invited the country to this challenge. Yeah. So this took place in Texas, uh, this famous speech. I believe it was, oh, what school is that? Ah. Rice. Rice, Rice University. In Houston. That's right. Yep. Rice University. All right. Oh, this requires a story. Yeah. Okay. Uh, space exploration, exploration is hard and it's dangerous. It's really dangerous. Unfortunately, we, lo we have lost people in the pursuit of getting ourselves into space. Uh, you wanna tell us about this one here? Yeah, so um, 
There was uh, three astronauts for Apollo 1, and they were doing some routine training. Um, unfortunately, the engineers um, had them in a 100% oxygen capsule. So at the time, they were just putting people in 100% oxygen. Right now, I believe the space station runs at about 10% oxygen, maybe a little more. Spacesuits um, are down to, well, spacesuits, I, I don't know what spacesuits are. I think, I I think spacesuits have higher oxygen. And so they, they are concerned with sparks in a spacesuit. So they do a lot of things to ground out their spacesuits. The idea stuff. of having a 100% oxygen atmosphere in the space capsules is that it's lighter. It's lighter. And every pound in space is precious. It, up until a few years ago, it cost about $5,000 per pound to put something into space. Uh, which means if I were to try to launch into space, it would cut, you know, I'm not going to do the math on that. I'm not going to do the math <laughs> yeah. on that, it's, but it's expensive. It's so it's your weight in gold. Yeah. yeah. It, every so. pound, every ounce is precious. All right. So what? Uh, so there was a, a spark. There was a spark. Yeah, there was a spark in um, the wiring. And, and you need three things for fire. You need fuel, you need oxygen, and you need Wow, a heat source. Yeah. And uh, so when that sparked, the air burned and it burned hot and it burned quick and it was very unfortunate and they couldn't get out. Yeah, so it, it really put a, a halt on the space program. That was Apollo 1. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. These were the crew um, that were lost, that were lost in, uh, in Apollo 1, Grissom, uh, Virgil Grissom, Edward White and Roger Chaffee. Yep. Um, Very so, brave men. And they are memorialized at the Astronauts Memorial Foundation in Florida. So if you're there, that's a great uh, thing to go see and find out more about uh, some of the people who um, who passed because of their their dedication to the program and space exploration. Yeah. Um, we had to pick ourselves up. You know, we had to pick ourselves up. Um, Can't stop now. Yeah, it was. Gotta we have going. to move on. We, you know, people at NASA, they know the risk. They know what's going on. They, but they, they, they boldly go where people haven't gone before. That's right. They're not doing it because it's safe. They're not yeah. doing it because because it's easy. Yeah, they try to minimize the risks, but um, there's always going to be a risk anytime you do something that yep. you've never done before. So Apollo One, we lost all three men that were on that mission. On the launch pad, they were just doing a test. They hadn't even launched. Yeah, they were just doing, just yeah. drilling. Seven launches later, we're orbiting the moon. Look at this, Apollo 8 took off from Earth, traveled three days to the moon, circled the moon and came back. Yeah, and this is uh, Apollo 8, it's where you got the first full shot somewhere along that line. Um, you got your first uh, picture of the Earth. They were able to the get entire back. entire Earth. Yeah, yeah, so it was, it's a famous picture. Um, but it was the entire earth in one frame because before that there had just been views of part of it, you know, so yeah, so yeah, full view of earth. And then five missions, two, th three missions after that, we're on the moon. Yeah, this is, uh, this is Apollo 11 and we landed on the moon. Um, so very, very cool. This, to me, it almost looks like Apollo 14. I might have put in the wrong slide there. That's yeah, okay. I mean, <laughs> the point is it's someone they, on the moon. Oh, yeah, because there's a rover there. So that's not Apollo yeah, 11. Yeah, that's not Apollo 11. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, after Apollo 11, after they got a few more missions to the moon, they were like, let's bring a car because <laughs> America. You'll notice that uh, at the top of this picture, so you've, you've got this, the, the pole that the flag is on, and then there's a stick at the top that the flag is hanging from because there's no air on the moon, there's no wind, there's nothing to make the flag blow. So they had to hold the flag up. Um, yeah. Okay, good. Okay, yeah, so Apollo 11. Um, Apollo 11 <laughs> happened and we had Buzz Aldrin. <laughs> this yeah. isn't a picture of Buzz Aldrin, by the way, but um, we, we go ahead and go to the Apollo 11 patch and kind of what this symbolizes. This recently, uh, this last summer, uh, 2019, was the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing, where a man landed on the moon. I mean, just... 50 years later, it's still incredible. Yeah, 50 years, it's still an incredible feat. I mean, we haven't gone back because there's so much expense there. Um, but right now, more than ever, NASA is gearing up 
to have permanent settlements on the moon, permanent, uh, permanent, um, permanent settlement. Yep. So, yeah. It's per called the Artemis moon. program. Artemis. Yeah. And they are getting people back to the moon. They are planning a station in orbit around the moon and they are planning a base on the moon and the name for that right now is artemis base oh and, and go ahead and go to the next slide a recent celebration was the anniversary of um apollo 13 and yeah famous words from apollo 13 houston we've had a problem yeah yeah so this is jim lovell jack swaggart um, and fred hayes um they had an oxygen tank rupture explode yeah. <laughs> he, he's using the fancy word for it. There you go. They had their uh, one of their oxygen tanks explode while they're in space. And if you're thinking, that sounds bad, you're correct. Yeah. It's bad. It's really bad. It's yeah. also not good. It, yeah. <laughs> they ended up, and they had already left Earth's orbit. Um, so they had left Earth's orbit. So they had to go to the moon. Um, and this is Apollo 13. The plan was to land on the moon. Of course, that be, they didn't have the resources. There was too much damage to their spacecraft. Um, mathematically, I think anybody would have bet on their death um, because that was, you know, with everything that when you find out the technical parts that they had to overcome for this, it is amazing. I mean, yeah. they were hours from death, if not minutes. Um, they were running out of oxygen. Um, they had to improvise some super smart engineers at NASA had to put together. I mean, it was literally a round hole with a square box and a round hole. And they had to engineer this thing with duct tape. Um, so, you know, that's one thing to always have on your missions is duct tape. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yep. So these guys ran into a really horrible accident in space. They made it. They survived. There was a movie made in the late 1990s called Apollo 13. If you haven't seen it, I highly suggest watching it. Outstanding movie. Yeah. Okay. And this is Alan Shepard. This is from Apollo 14. So not only was he the first American to orbit, um, he was the uh, he was he landed on the moon after Apollo 13. Um, this mess. This mission was very critical. Um, if they had any more accidents in space, there was chances that they would scrub the entire program, which means stop yep. the entire program. Um, so they sent in one of the best, uh, Alan Shepard, to go in and um, lead a team to the moon and back. And it went off. It went on without a hitch. And they planted another flag on the moon. Yeah, more flags. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Is this Skylab? This is Skylab. All right. Good. So. The International Space Station was not the first space station. It's just the most recent, and it's not going to be the last. This is a picture and a diagram of Skylab. This was the fir first first American mm -hmm. space station. Mm -hmm. It's a lab in the sky, and it wasn't very big. Uh, just enough room for them to live and maybe do some experiments. The real challenge was, can we live in space for a time? Wow. The answer was yes. Yeah. Yep. For sure, and then that helps bring uh, to to view the space station, the International Space Station. Yep, uh, a few of our very astute viewers are pointing out to me in the question and answer section that we are running really low on time. I'm aware. I'm also, <laughs> you know, I'm I'm going to choose to go a few minutes long today. We're, we're going to power through the rest of the slides that Diego has here, so we're going to go a couple minutes long. Feel free to, to to jump out if you need to go do something else. That's totally okay. Uh, we get excited when we talk about space and we go off into side stories and all other <laughs> stuff and it takes a, it's a long time to get anywhere. All right. This is the coolest thing we've ever put. One of the coolest things we've ever put into space. <laughs> it's a space, it's a space shuttle. shuttle. Oh. It's gorgeous. Look at that. I mean, there's better ways to go to space than that, but there's not a cooler way to go to space yeah, than that. The space shuttle is a modern marvel. Look at that thing. I, I mean, yeah, the design, the ambition of it, the, the tiles below the space shuttle to re-enter Earth. There is um, so much we could talk about. That, that thing is the most complicated machine that humans have ever built. There are over one million moving parts on that thing, which makes it pretty great, pretty incredible. It also makes it prone to error. Mm -hmm. uh, Every moving part is a chance for failure. Um, 
But 135 of those missions launched, 135 times. Uh, that's really in incredible. Yeah. Henry says, it's like the Ferrari of space. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> yeah, the Ferrari of space. Yep. Great, great job. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to talk about actually putting a car in space. <laughs> we're going to talk about that. So here is, we're, we're going to end off on this. Is this yeah, our yeah, last, slide? last slide? All right. Here's just a general timeline of uh, space exploration. A yeah, a yep. recap. So 1957, the first satellite, Sputnik, was put into space. The Russians were the first ones to do that. One year later, 1958, NASA, the, the, the American Space Program, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration is what NASA stands yeah, for. Because they wanted to beat Sputnik out. <laughs> That's right. Boom, 1961, we have Yuri Gargarin going to space. Uh, a, a feat for all mankind that man could go to space and return. That's right. And that was just four years after the first satellite in space. Yeah. Five years after that, the first probe, the first thing landed on the moon. That was Luna 9. Again, Russia beat us. Yeah, Russia, it, it, Russia is putting us in a game. We were like, That's were right. like check, check. <laughs> Russia was ahead of us every step of the way, uh, except for getting humans on the moon. That was Apollo 11, 1969. And then six years later in 1975, we got the first probe on Venus. That was the Venera 7 probe. Again, Russia. Man, the, Russia really had a program going. Yeah. Uh, two years later, 1977, Voyager 1 and 2. These are um, even, still today the fastest that humans have ever been able to get an object to go. Voyager 1 and 2, even though they launched in 1977, they're still alive today. These are satellites. These are machines at, that have left our solar system. And they are still broadcasting to us. Just these little pings every once in a while to let us know they're still alive. Uh, a, few, a few years later, uh, 1981, first reusable space shuttle. This idea of reusable space flight. You can launch, land, and launch again with the same thing. We've been chasing that for a long time. The space shuttle was supposed to be cheap because of that reason. It turned out to be way more expensive than we wanted. But still, we were able to realize getting something up into space and back and sending again. The Russians also had a space shuttle program that never launched, but they, they were developing their own shuttle as well. Gorgeous thing. Uh, 1995, the first probe to Jupiter, the Galileo, uh, and getting some really amazing, incredible pictures and science readings about Jupiter and those outer planets. 1998, the International Space Station was created. It, I mean, yes. it took dozens of launches and they built this thing piece by piece it's like a lego set in space it's an um, amazing amazing thing but really incredible stuff and i love that it looks like a tie fighter <laughs> so there's that 2014 the first landing on a comet we landed a spaceship on a comet um, european space agency yep mm -hmm. so th good job europe on that that was the rosetta mission and um the comet ended up looking like kind of like a rubber duck, a giant rubber duck, which is really cool. <laughs> 2015, there was this, again, there's this idea of reusable oh, rockets, would... reusable, like launch, land, fix it, and launch it again. It, sh it should be a lot cheaper. I went nuts for that. That was the coolest thing. We've got that now. Seeing the footage of that. So That was a game changer. Yep. So SpaceX is a private company based in America, and for the last five years, years now they have been launching things to space using rockets that they've already launched it launches it comes back and lands and it launches again ah it's really incredible and that is bringing the cost down it's a lot cheaper to do that if you imagine if you had to buy a new car every time you drove somewhere you drove somewhere you threw the car out you bought a new car it would be so expensive <laughs> uh, or to many places <laughs> yeah or if you every time you flew somewhere you had to buy a brand new plane you know, you, yeah. you're flying there and you, you know, you Parachute crash the plane because <laughs> you can't land it. And then you buy a new plane to fly back. No one would go anywhere. Yeah. And then 20, in the 2020s, you know, we're, we're trying to get the first people on Mars. Uh, we're going to get people back to the moon in 2024. Hopefully a few years after that, we have people on Mars. We are way over our time. I'm going to stick around in the um, Q&A section at the end of this so, so that we can um, answer a few more questions, but we need to wrap up because coming up soon, <laughs> Robin is talking about American history. Oh, we got to do the codes. Talks, what? Don't forget the codes. What? We got to do the codes. 
Oh, the code. Promo codes. Yeah. Right. Yes. Good. All right. Good. So. You can go to heronbooks.com and use the promo code Delphian30 and get 30% off of any of the curriculum that's available there. So some really, really great stuff. Um, we're six minutes late. Thank you so much, everyone. We're going to be talking tomorrow about the future of space exploration. Wow. Tomorrow is my favorite day. Yeah.